Now we're going to talk about the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, some people might get the idea the Massachusetts Bay Colony came first because it certainly talked about a lot more with the Pilgrims and all that, uh, but I'll get to the why that is in a minute. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded by Puritans. Now, Puritans are not called Puritans because they don't have a good time and they wear bland clothes and they, they don't like the opposite sex or anything. Puritans are called Puritans because they are a type of Protestant who are members of the Anglican Church. Remember, that's the church Henry VIII founded, but all he did was change who was in charge. He got rid of the Pope and replaced it with the, the monarch of England. Puritans want to purify the, the Anglican Church of any elements of Catholicism, get rid of the rituals and the rites and the, the ornately uh, decorated churches and all those sorts of things. So that's what a Puritan is. Now, these Puritans were separatist, meaning they wanted to break away from the Anglican Church and make their own church. And so they ran away from England. Uh, and they ran away, of course, in 1608 to Holland. Now, they went to Holland because Holland had religious freedom. You could practice whatever you want and believe whatever you want there. And this drove the Puritans crazy because they weren't looking for uh, religious free, religiously free society. They wanted a society where they could make everybody believe what they wanted to believe. And so after 12 years in Holland, when their kids began hanging out with non-Puritans, and this began to freak them out, they left Holland and they set sail for Virginia. Yeah, they were trying to go to Jamestown, but they got lost. They weren't very good sailors. They ended up in Plymouth. On this boat, the Mayflower, of course, 35 saints and 67 of what they called strangers arrived. Now, the strangers means they, they, they weren't Puritans. They had a problem, though, because they didn't have permission to be there. They had gotten permission from the king to go to Virginia, but now there were some that were completely different. So on December 21, 1620, they sat down and wrote a legal document called the Mayflower Compact, where they basically agreed to set up a government there and then begged the king's permission because they were someplace they weren't supposed to be. Much like in Virginia, the first winter was rough. Uh, more than half of the, the original, um, what, just over 100 settlers died in that first winter. But when spring came, they had a couple of uh, uh, strokes of good luck. They met an English guy who was already living there. Now, to me, the reason we don't talk about this more, I, I don't know. But there was actually an English guy who had got sick of England. He was a retired lawyer who moved and lived all by himself in Plymouth. They also met a native named Squanto. Squanto is another amazing coincidence because he had been picked up by John Smith uh, more than a decade earlier, taken back to England, lived there for, for a few years, learned English, escaped, and made his way back to the New World, which is an amazing story in and of himself. But imagine the luck of these pilgrims to meet an English guy who already lived there and a Native American who spoke English. Squanto and the other Native Americans taught the pilgrims how to survive, which turned out to be a terrible mistake for them. For one thing, in 1633, smallpox swept through the area and wiped out the Native Americans. Of course, the Europeans had more resistance to that. The farmland was bad. The economy was based on fishing and, and trading with the Native Americans for furs. And by 1630, the population had only grown to 300. This is still pretty small, right? William Bradford is their leader. This is a very poor community. In fact, they only had one plow, and they had to share it uh, between the whole community. And a plow, of course, was a major piece of equipment uh, at the time. But they were just happy to be left alone. They didn't go there to get rich. They went there to be left alone. James I and Charles I, when, they, uh, when Charles I, I should say, dissolves Parliament in 1629, many more Puritans left England to come to the New World. This is going to be the events that lead to the English Civil War, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The Massachusetts Bay Colony gets an official charter to be a Puritan refuge in, in uh, New England, which is what they called the area. John Winthrop will be the governor beginning in 1630 when he arrives with 17 ships and 1,000 people. And he brings the charter from England, which is important because by having the charter on their person, it can't be revoked or changed back in England. And this gave them some degree of independence. The areas they settle, we call them places like Plymouth, uh, but in reality, they're w what are today Boston and the surrounding area around Boston. Um, they believed in, in living useful, conscientious lives of thrift and hard work, and they considered any material success proof that God loved them. Uh, we're going to talk about a, a John Winthrop uh, a lot in class soon with his famous City on the Hill, City Upon a Hill speech. But they were also an oppressive theocracy. You were not allowed to gr disagree with the religious leaders in this community. The first, summer, uh, first winter after the new arrivals came, the thousand new people, 200 died. But again, the Native Americans stepped in, helped feed them, kept them going. 
A, a major difference between Virginia and the Plymouth Colony is that the Plymouth Colony came over in family units. They had women and children. These were families that moved here to live, not men that came over here to try to get rich quick and return home. Some, uh, many that left though. Some left because the land was poor farmland. Other left because they were fed up with the religious oppression. Uh, a famous example is in 1639 when Thomas Hooker uh, gets into a disagreement with the, with the Puritan church and leaves, leads a group of followers out of the Plymouth colony and establishes uh, a new colony, Connecticut. Connecticut's notable for having the first written constitution in the world, the fundamental orders of Connecticut, and also expanding suffrage to uh, all white, all free white males. In 1639, um, another colony was established called New Haven, also in Connecticut. Uh, that was established uh, to be. Um, uh, these were people who felt that the Puritans were not strict enough. They thought that Boston was beginning to lose its way and becoming irreligious, and so they wanted to establish a more austere, a more stricter version of Puritanism. Importantly, Roger Williams will leave when he decides that the commingling of the government and the religion is a problem. Not a problem for the government, but a problem for religion. He comes to believe that when you have a theocracy, a religious government, the, gov the, the religion gets tainted. And so he leaves and he makes friends with a group of Native Americans. He had actually learned their language and got along well with them. The government tries to hunt him down and deport him, but he eventually gets away and founds a city called Providence in 1644. He also gains a charter, and so this becomes another new colony. Pro uh, Providence, which today we call Rhode Island, uh, is most notable for having complete and total religious freedom. Roger Williams even says in, in the charter, you can worship the devil if you want. Uh, this is a far greater degree of religious freedom than any other area uh, in the world probably at that time. The final exile I want to talk about is Ann Hutchison. You probably notice right away she's a woman. That's one of the things that makes her so important. She began questioning that the Puritan leaders of a community really had a relationship with God. She began claiming that they were essentially false uh, preachers and claimed surprisingly that her and her brother-in-law were the real preachers. Um, this is a, a, her philosophy is called antinomianism. Um, and she demanded that females be allowed to preach, which was completely against uh, Puritan teachings. Uh, they arrested her and put her on trial in 1637, and she embarrassed uh, the, the, the Puritan community by arguing from the Bible. She was able to use Scripture extremely effectively and, and uh, prove her point. Well, they didn't really care if she could prove her point or not. They convicted her of heresy and banished her from the, from the area. They also, by the way, would establish Harvard uh, University uh, to train preachers so they wouldn't lose any more arguments to women. Anne Hutchinson originally goes to Providence, Rhode Island, where Roger Williams went, uh, and then moves to New York, where she is killed in a Native American raid. In 1629, New Hampshire and Maine are founded. These are also both going to be parts of the Massachusetts colony. Uh, but few people move to those regions, so while they're officially colonies, they're lightly populated. Let's talk about the relationship between the settlers and the Native Americans. Now, this starts very friendly. The Native Americans actually teach the settlers how to farm. Uh, the, native, uh, the, the settlers also benefit from the fact that the natives have already cleared the land and plowed the fields and planted crops and these sorts of things. They have an active fur trade between the two groups. Um, and the settlers are constantly trying to convert the Native Americans, uh, sometimes successfully. But the desire for land and the desire to eliminate the Native American religion will ultimately lead to war. In 1637, in the Connecticut Valley, uh, the Pequot, Pequot War breaks out where the, uh, the, the white settlers... Uh, viciously wipe out the Pequot Native American tribe. In 1675, King Philip's War uh, occurs. This is a war against the Wampanoag Indians. More than a thousand settlers are killed and the Wampanoag tribe is destroyed. Uh, they ally with the Mohawk Indians of the famous haircut. The Mohawks, that is, ally with the settlers because they're not friendly with the Wampanoag and kill the Wampanoag leader, Metacom. The Native American alliance uh, collapses after the war, and the settlers, of course, turn on the Mohawks and wipe them out as well. Uh, King Philip's War was something, if you look at a percentage of people who died and people who served in it and the uh, percentage of the property value destroyed, was on a par with World War II. Now, it's a much smaller war, but it was a much smaller community. And King Philip's War would probably be the most significant experience for most colonists in the North uh, all the way up until the, the, the Revolutionary Period. Um, that it was a huge deal for them. One more thing I want to point out. 
is that we think uh, often that the settlers, of course, they won because they had better technology. This isn't true. At first, the settlers had this thing called a matchlock you see over here. A matchlock meant you had to actually light the powder with, with like a match. Um, it was incredibly inaccurate and difficult to handle. You see the guy needs a stick to do it. The flintlock was a little bit better. Uh, it struck flint, so you didn't have to light it by hand, but it wasn't very accurate either and not terribly useful. The bow and arrow of the Native American was actually superior to both of these weapons, particularly when you're fighting in the woods. The Native Americans, by the way, were able to adapt to the, uh, the, the, the weapons of the settlers, while the whites did not really adapt to the bow and arrow. Uh, the reality is the Native Americans didn't lose because they had inferior military technology. They lost because of disease, because the, the white settlers spread disease to the Native Americans um, that they couldn't resist.